You know, in my own work, my own modest work, you know, no one has been more important than Jim Harrison. I might sound like I <clears throat> have a speech impediment. It's because I had two teeth out early this morning. And uh, I do it in an economical way. They just put me on a gurney and back me into the muffler shop. <laughs> That's really not true. And I also now need this magnifying glass to read. And I said actually to my actual dentist this morning, Liz Blavatsky, uh, amongst mammals, it's the eyes and the teeth that go first, which is obvious to a lot of us. <laughs> but I think uh, I've heard some uh, Jim Welch in 71 on a ill thought out trip I did with Tom McGuane, a novelist from over the mountain. We drove up to Browning because we were both fans of this book of poems, Writing the Earth Boy 40 by James Welch. And we stopped in to Missoula to offer a hand of friendship to these Missoula writers. We were uh, driving a used Porsche <laughs> that up on the res we had to throw money out the window to get the kids to push it to start. <laughs> and Mr. McGuane was, uh, well, so, on the nightstand in their motel room, I was looking at a, a quart bottle of uh, strawberry Maalox, which isn't very attractive on a nightstand, <laughs> just to keep going. And then out in the parking lot in the morning, there'd be all these Indian kids pushing the car while we were throwing money out the window. <laughs> But when we met James Welch and Missoula at Bill Kittridge's house, we felt a little odd, I did, to admit that we'd gotten kicked out of an Indian bar in Browning. And Jim was curious, or typical of good humor, I shook her hands. He says, that's really hard to do for a white guy. <laughs> He said, well, we did it. That was typical of Jim. He had maybe one of the most complicated senses of humor I've ever known in a man, which is not typically uh, rare. It's true of the Anishinaabe that I grew up around in northern Michigan. Uh, for instance, in 71, after this book got a lot of notice, writing the Earth by 40, by all American poets were aware of it. But uh, at the time, I was trying to spring myself from academia. So I was writing some of those, uh, what they would call nature essays for uh, Sports Illustrated, naturally in the back of the magazine, well and back. But I had this not so brilliant idea that I'd go hunting with Indians and write about it. <laughs> so I called Russell Means, who I had met, and Russell said, well, if you come out here with the Lakota, we might eat your dog. <laughs> and 
I said, well, thanks, I guess I'll pass you by because I love my dog. <laughs> but then I called Jim in Missoula and he says, oh, bullshit, Russell's never eaten a dog. <laughs> if you come hunting with me, you don't need to worry because I don't remember any Blackfoot recipes for a dog. <laughs> That's what I mean about the sense of humor. And he said, also, you're a little hefty. And the way we hunt, you have to be able to hold on in the back of a pickup and aim a gun, too, <laughs> while you're going 50 miles an hour <laughs> over the Great Pines. I said, I don't think Eastern sportsmen want to read about this. <laughs> I took a pass at this. But so we met and ran into each other any number of times over the years until the last time when he said, well, here's an example of what he said. My tenant farmer on a fruit farm I owned in northern Michigan fell off the barn and rammed his femur through his bladder up into his body. Well, I went in to see him. He was in the body cast, and I broke into tears, and his name was Linus Couturier. He was the seventh son, but that didn't do him any good. Uh, so I broke into tears, and he says, Oh, Mr. Harrison, don't cry. These things happen to people. And the last time in the, uh, the bar and grill, I put my arm around Jim. He said, oh, uh, just calm down. These things happen to people. That was a week before he died. But anyway, over the years, I've had any number of copies of writing the Earth Boy 40s. And when you mention poetry in Montana, you might see your audience bolt and drive to Wilsaw. <laughs> but maybe they can be patient. Yeah. So I found a couple of poems I wanted to read to the I remember from literally the first time I read it. I actually might read one because sometimes I get sort of overwhelmed by this one and know that over the years, maybe it's the best protest poem I've ever read. Maybe the best protest poem of our time. And since there have been hundreds of thousands of protest poems written in our time, that's saying something. This is called The Man from Washington. Seems like just a year ago I could read. <laughs> the Man from Washington. The end came easy for most of us, packed away in our crude beginnings on some far corner of a flat world. We didn't expect much more than firewood and buffalo robes to keep us warm. The man came down a slouching dwarf with rainwater eyes and spoke to us. He promised that life would go on as usual, that treaties would be signed, and everyone, everyone, man, woman, and child, would be inoculated against a world in which we had no part, a world of money, promise, and disease. So that's what happened. 
I've clocked this pretty carefully the last 40 or 50 years by reading rather than living. And a poem is about a, uh, a chapter in the history of Zortman that I didn't really know about and we'll have to research. Research is easier than living. <laughs> I remember when I researched Dava, which took a couple of years, I didn't want to start writing because I didn't want to stop researching. <laughs> the renegade wants words. We died in Zortman on a Sunday in the square beneath skies so blue the eagle spoke in foreign tongues. Our deeds were numbered, burning homes, stealing women, wine and gold. No one spoke of our good side. Those times we fed the hulking idiot, mapped these plains with sticks, and first drove herds of bison wild for meat and legend. We expected no gratitude, no mercy on our heads, but a word, the way we rode naked across these burning hills. Perhaps spring break, break up made us move and trust in stars, ice, not will, made our women ice. We burned homes for heat, painted our bodies in blood. Who could talk revenge? Were we wild for wanting men to listen to the earth, the plant only by moons? In Zartman on the Sunday we died. No bells, no man in black to tell us where we failed. Makeshift hangmen, our necks, noon and the eagles. Not one good word. So well, I'm going to retire now. I wrote a, uh, another introduction to Welch last year, and I said to the publish, are you crazy? He doesn't need any introduction. And he said, well, everyone needs an introduction. I said, you sound like a paper asshole from New York. <laughs> <laughs> now, who, else, who could say that? So thank you.